first of all, I'd just like to welcome you all to our brunch time talk, at least it's brunch time in Scotland. Um, I'm Janie from the Stirling Photography Festival. We've been running our festival this year to the theme of flow. Um, and that's a slight nod to Scotland celebrating its year in coasts and waterways. But it's also a little bit of like an, an acknowledgement of um, the tide that we've all been carried along on over the past uh, 18 months or so. Um, absolutely delighted to welcome you all here and thank you for signing in at bedtime and beer o'clock from across the world. Um, and uh, particularly big welcome to Brett, whom I'll introduce in a minute. Just from a wee technical point of view, um, Zef's been directing us this morning to our chat function where we're going to capture where you're from and uh, questions and things. Um, so thank you, Zef, for supporting us there. Problem. It's been quite kind this morning. We've done a wee dry run with Brett and everything's working. But if we do get any wobbles with internet connection, we might just ask Brett to put his camera off um, as we go. So thank you, everyone, for coming along. Um, what I normally do at this point uh, is, is, is obviously welcome our speaker and introduce, introduce them. Um, I've got so much I could say about Brett, uh, but I'll start as I always do by saying we first met, I think it was probably about the 1st of June, 1965, um, when he was almost two and I was just a day old. Um, so as you might imagine, I've got, I've got a lot to say about him. Um, but we'll kind of cut to the chase, and uh, this is about Brett and his talk. But um, briefly, I mean, I guess my memories of Brett is he was always a great outdoorsy brother, always out walking the dogs, disappearing for long days at a time, coming back with pockets fulls of fossils and all sorts of things from his trips and his travels in our backyard. Um, he then went on to study science um, and uh, graduated a little before me. And I went off to start a career in the food industry and Brett went off to start his first big adventure, I suppose, when he joined Operation Rally and sailed from Japan to Australia through the Solomons on a tall ship. That's where he yeah. met uh, yeah. his lovely wife and um, the rest is history, I suppose. But from there, Brett's travels have continued and he's travelled widely, um, passionate about the world and the environment. And... <coughs> photograph beautifully what he sees but he also writes about it so um looking forward to some of the stories he tells us today um Brett now finds himself in Tasmania having had another first stint in Australia yeah. and uh, was boomeranged back to Tassie we visited him there uh, in 2018 as a family and I have to say is one of the best tour guides you could ever wish for so what I'd like to do is just hand over to Brett. He's going to talk to the theme of flow. And we're very aware here in Scotland that the eyes of the world are on Glasgow this coming um, October with the COP26 gathering of world leaders. And a theme that's run through our photography festival um, is has been uh, perhaps our role as photographers. Sustainable photography has been a big theme. But what we document and the changes that we see and the stories we share and 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 stories we tell about what we find. So Brett's going to talk about Tasmania. Um, and I think it might prompt us all to think a little bit about our role in the world as photographers um, and as just human beings. So I'd like to hand over to Brett without further ado, and um, I really look forward to hearing what you've got to, to say about the, the Roaring Forties, Brett. Thanks very much. Okay. Thank you very much, Janie. Um, I'm very uh, touched that there's such interest for not just me personally and what I have to say tonight, but also that people might be curious about this far-flung corner of the world. In fact, maybe the last corner of the the, the uh, inhabited world that doesn't have COVID-19. We haven't had a case here for well over a year. Even New Zealand's um, come down with a, a bit of a runaway situation over there. So. Yes, it's been a very strange uh, experience, I think, to witness all what's going on out there in the world, but not actually be directly impacted. 
other than that we're limited in where we can go and what we can do and who we can see. I haven't seen my son for over two years, for example, and that's probably going to go on for a bit longer. Um, however, you didn't come here to hear, hear too much about that and my personal on the beach kind of experience, because it feels a bit like Neville shoots on the beach, uh, living down here where everything goes crazy and everywhere else. Um, the majority of what we're going to talk about tonight, though, is going to be set around this the area that you see in this map, which is where I live. I live in a little town just south of Hobart, about 20 kilometers. It's not actually on the map, funnily enough, uh, but it's just close to Kingston. We're about 10 kilometers from there, and we live in the hills in a small acreage property. Um, I came here four and a half years ago, but my relationship, if you like, with Tasmania goes back to the 1980s when I first came here as a young traveller. Backpackers, they call them these days, but I don't think that term was in vogue back in 1989. Um, and I came here really because I'd seen some postcards in a shop in Sydney by a photographer called Peter Dombrovskis, and they were utterly beguiling and magnificent. They kind of spoke of a place that was beyond time, something primeval about what, what this guy depicted in his photographs. Peter Dombrovskis, uh, he's dead now, he died about 25 years ago whilst photographing out in the remote wilderness of southwest Tasmania. But he had a huge influence on me personally as a photographer, but also he, his images have had a huge impact on the wild parts of Tasmania. And in fact, I'm going to start off tonight's slideshow showing you a photograph that actually isn't one of mine. It's one of uh, Peter's. Uh, this is uh, a photograph, and I've I've uh, credited, credited it, uh, hopefully, uh, in its fullness to Peter. This was a photograph that he took in 1979 on the Franklin River, which is one of the wild rivers on the west coast of Tasmania. Uh, you might remember it if you're old enough, like me, uh, that it, it was the site of a dam protest. The government of the time, which was a conservative government, both in, in the state and nationally wanted to dam this river for hydroelectric power. And uh, when I was teaching photography in, in uh, Yorkshire years ago, I used to like to get my students to think about what photography can achieve at its very best, what kind of important things can be achieved. And I used this photograph by Peter to demonstrate that great things can be achieved through photography. So this is Morning Mist at Rock Island Bend on the Franklin. Now I can't uh, hope to uh, emulate his work, but um, it's, uh, it's certainly been influential in my life and influential in the, the kind of history of preservation and conservation on the island of Tasmania. Much of what I'm going to talk about today, though, goes with the theme of flow, and Tasmania sits in a, a, a series of winds that blow concentrically around the planet from the west called the Roaring Forties. And they bring very dynamic changes in weather to this place, even more so than the Scotland that I grew up in. Uh, the weather can change within minutes by 15 degrees centigrade. And that has happened to me before while swimming in local beaches. This is one of the very early uh, photographs that I put together as a panorama taken down on Bruny Island. And we're going to talk a little bit about Bruny Island as we go and uh, that general area. And uh, it kind of encapsulates this dramatic weather that, uh, that we get in this part of Tasmania. We're on the east coast, 
and Hobart is actually the second driest capital state city in the whole of Australia after Adelaide. And yet still we get very dramatic changeable weather that can bring huge amounts of rain within a few kilometres of the city itself. Kunanyi or Mount Wellington, which in, in many ways dominates the weather of the city, sits just behind the town and gets, you know, uh, an, an awful lot more rainfall than uh, the city itself. Actually, actually catches a lot of snow as well. There was snow on it last week. Um, So when the, the very first explorers first came to Tasmania, or Van Diemen's Land, as it would have been called in its earliest days, uh, they sailed into the Derwent. And this little island that you see is called Iron Pot. It's called Iron Pot, sadly, because uh, one of the early industries of Tasmania was in rendering whale blubber. And they had a huge iron pot on this rock, in which they used to... Uh, to do that rather horrible, despicable uh, task. But it's one of the first things that the, uh, the seafaring uh, arriver to this place would, would come across. There's obviously a little lighthouse on it today, but uh, back then there wouldn't have been that. And this is taken from very close to where I, where I actually live. I, I took that from the deck of a house we rented for about a month uh, shortly after we arrived here. Slightly further up, the Derwent. And the Derwent's a, an estuary, maybe on a similar scale to the Forth or the Clyde, perhaps. Um, and this is the Tasman Bridge. This is a bridge that, that spans across the river and was opened, I believe, in about 1972 or three, something like that. If there's any locals who can put me right on that, uh, then please do in the chat. Um, but again, it's, it's another photograph for me that demonstrates the kind of dramatic shifting nature of, of weather, particularly in the summer and, uh, sorry, in the winter and spring seasons. But yeah, it can happen at any time of year, actually. Now, the Derwent is a, an interesting uh, place because it's been a bit of an experiment in human endeavor, I suppose, insofar as that it's been quite heavily industrialized and the population of the city obviously lives all along its coast. But uh, there have been, uh, problems environmentally at the local level. Uh, and for example, a little uh, rare species of fish called a handfish was very recently declared extinct in the Derwent. It only lived in the Derwent, didn't live anywhere else. So a very high degree of endemism. And uh, yeah, it's gone. And largely because of human activity from uh, industrial processes to the creation of uh, pollution and fishing and so on. This is the, um, th these are the hills that I actually live in. This is, the, th these are the Margate Hills looking across Northwest Bay. And uh, it's another example of these very dramatic little weather events. This was a cloud burst that, that occurred one one spring day. And yet where I'm standing on the other side of the bay, only about three or four kilometers away, the rainfall is markedly less than it is in the hills. So 20 kilometers from Hobart, which gets about 620 millimeters of rain per year, which is similar to the east coast of England, actually. Um, in the Margate Hills, we probably get more like a thousand millimeters of rain. We're only 20 k's away. But on the side of the bay that I'm on, it's probably back to Hobart level of rainfall. This is a, a view from a hill very local to me. I like to do a lot of local photography, and that's a theme that I think will come up uh, 
more as we go through the slideshow. I've, I've done this for many years. I did this when I lived in Yorkshire. Uh, even when I lived in Scotland 20 years ago, I was reluctant to do unnecessary uh, road journeys, I suppose. So what you're seeing here is are places that I can reach on a bicycle often. Uh, so this is a photograph looking over a little community called Snug, which is very close to where I live. And we're looking out across the north end of Bruny Island. That's the Dontrecasto Channel, named after Bruny Dontrecasto, the first man to sail up here for the French Navy in 1792, I believe it was. And then in the far distance is the Tasman Peninsula, which uh, is a, a very dramatic uh, little bit of land and almost entirely a national park. This is also where the Port Arthur uh, shootings happened about 25 years ago, which some of you no doubt remember. Now, I go up here quite a lot to this, this uh, little bit of land to take photographs. There's a lot going on that you, you see a lot of interplay with light. And I've even been up there at night. I'd actually gone up to photograph a rumoured aurora that was going to happen. It didn't happen, but this is this is the same view, and uh, there was a rather magnificent uh, display of the Milky Way, just dipping into the eastern uh, Tasman Sea. When we first arrived, we uh, we arrived at a little uh, remote, sparsely populated community on what's called Ralph's Bay um, and that looks to the west. So where I live now it's very hard to get a sunset but if I travel to the other side of the Derwent you get magnificent sunsets and we stayed over here a couple of times actually. We looked after a house for a, a couple that are friends of ours when they went on holiday and uh, the big mountain that you see in the middle is Mount Wellington or Kunanyi to the local indigenous peoples. And it's uh, a magnificent thing. It's a little bit like uh, Ben Nevis dominates the weather around Fort William in that environment. It's got a similar effect. And uh, it's certainly, it's uh, a bit of a totem, I think, for Hobart. Recently, uh, there was a plan to construct a, a uh, cable car up to the summit of the mountain. You can already drive to the summit of the mountain. It's not, it's not like in the, the British sense where a mountain has to be climbed by human effort. Uh, here you can actually drive to the summit. But, there, but I, there was a private company wanted to put in a cable car. And at this point, it looks as though it's being turned down, but uh, that remains to be seen what happens. There's another example of uh, Wellington sitting across that same bay, Ralph's Bay, but on a different occasion. A magnificent place to enjoy the sunset. Now there's another event that's happened uh, on a few rare occasions since I've come here to live. Uh, and this is, this is a thing called a crepuscular, or crepuscular rays is how they are known. So the sun's setting directly behind me. I'm looking to the east and you get this bouncing reflection of light from the upper atmosphere and it's illuminating onto the uh, Tasman Peninsula, which is over beyond that darker land in the foreground. And here's another example of a single crepuscular ray falling onto the Tasman, almost spotlighting it. Very, very peculiar. I'd never seen this before, but then I hadn't lived on an East Coast before I came to live in Tasmania. I'd always been a kind of a West Coast or an inland dwelling person. Now, this is a photograph I took only about three or four months ago on a beach on the East Coast. And I'm looking across to an island, a rather dramatic island called Mariah. Uh, 
of which where I hope to go and visit soon. That, that island is entirely a national park. Uh, so there are no vehicles on it. Nobody lives on it other than a ranger, perhaps. Um, and you can only go there with a bicycle or on foot. But again, this dramatic uh, generation of weather fronts that piles through uh, for much of the year in, in Tasmania, completely obliterating and, and masking the island, but it's out there somewhere. Five minutes later, that squall passed and, and it emerged again. But that was a photograph that um, kind of appealed to me as, uh, as a piece of stripped down, uh, you know, um, bare bones kind of, uh, of an image. Further up that coast, there are some beautiful beaches that are all within national parks. Uh, in fact, I think about 35% uh, of Tasmania is National Park. It's, it's vast. Um, and much of it wilderness that only the very hardiest of walker can get into. But this is one of those national parks that's more uh, amenable, more uh, accessible. And in fact, there's a campground very close to where, where I actually but I, I, I took this photograph. It's called Friendly Beaches, and the peninsula to the south is called Fresene, which um, is a, a, a very favoured uh, national park destination for Tasmanians and others. Although at the moment, there's only Tasmanians that are getting here during the, uh, <clears throat> the current pandemic situation. And a bit further up the coast, there is another beautiful area called Bay of Fires. I believe called that because when the first uh, Europeans sailed up that coast, they spotted lots of little uh, fires lit by the indigenous people. Uh, very, very beautiful area, known for its painted uh, orange lichen rocks. And again, being in the East Coast doesn't get a huge amount of rain, but gets a lot of dramatic weather spilling over. Uh, from the rest of the island. A place that I like to holiday because it's, uh, it's a very easy place to go and photograph, but not terribly safe for swimming. We, uh, my wife and I and my daughter all got caught in a rip last summer, which we managed to get out of clearly, but uh, yes, you're, you've got to be very careful in these beaches. Now, um, this is a photograph of one of the famous three capes on the Tasman Peninsula. This is Cape Raoul and it's made of dolerite. And uh, uh, geologically speaking, dolerite occurs more in Tasmania than any other location on the planet. It's a uh, kind of a basaltic rock, I suppose you would say. It's um, cooled, you know, quite close to the surface at some point after a great uh, amount of volcanic activity. And then this is what remains, these tall columnar uh, kind of uh, multi-sided columns of rock. So a little bit like uh, basalt does in the, in the United Kingdom, but dollarite is a unique chemical composition. So there are three capes down on the uh, Tasman and the Tasmanian government have kind of uh, taking them out of the, uh, they're, they're within national parks, but they've made them almost semi-privatized. They can't stop people going and walking around these capes, but uh, that's kind of the kind of the feeling that they, they try to put out there. And it's a rather expensive uh, walk that you can do, staying in nice huts and, you know, being sort of almost semi-catered to. But if you go into the center of the island, there are whole mountains made of this rock type. Also down in the Tasman, there's a very interesting uh, geological feature called the tessellated pavement, which is this flat wave cut platform with these odd geometric shapes within it. 
and somewhere off that coast, there, um, there are dramatic changes going on below the surface of the ocean. Because not only is Tasmania caught up in the flow of weather created by the Roaring Forties, but we're also at the terminal end of the East Australian Current, or the Eastern Australian Current, which you might remember if you've seen the film uh, Finding Nemo. Um, now that current has been strengthening and warming over the last few decades, I suppose, and it's creating huge change, all out of sight, so people can't see it, they don't tend to worry about it. But Tasmania was known for having some of the tallest giant kelp forests on the planet, and they're all dying. They're, they're all disappearing because of the uh, increase in water temperature and because of the uh, other species that are being brought in that warming water. So another example of uh, our changing world. Another uh, thing that's quite obviously going on around the coast of, of Tasmania, and particularly right where I live, I notice it a lot, is that there's been this rising of, of the sea levels. And uh, there are a lot of uh, consequences of that. So here at Mortimer Bay, on the east coast of the Derwent, uh, you can that there are numerous large dead gum trees that are just uh, I suppose they're capitulating to the uh, the ingress of salt water to the roots, which they do not uh, do well with. So this one has been lying in the beach ever since I came to Tassie. This is a, a this is about fifty meters along the shore, and it's dead. I actually had gone out this night again to photograph the Milky Way, but this tree, which I'm, you can just see me in there illuminating it with a head torch. Uh, this tree's dead, the one behind is dead, the one behind that's dead. And as you walk all along the beach, there are scores and scores of uh, dead gum trees, uh, which I'm assuming is to do with the ingress of uh, salt water to the roots. I came along here one evening, for example, and that whole dead tree was completely submerged at high tide, and I had to walk along the, uh, the kind of heathy back of the beach. This is another example of what's happening along the coast. This is this, this isn't one of uh, Hobart's more desirable suburbs, Sandy Bay, it's called, just to the south of the city, and uh, you can see that this softer rock, a sandstone rock, is being eaten away at, and uh, Yes, you can you can almost get the, the feeling that some people's gardens are already starting to, you know, give in to the inevitable. Certainly lots of fallen trees along there. I went to a lecture oh, about the first month, I think, I was living in, uh, in Tasmania, at, at University of Tasmania. And it was being given by a couple of scientists who do all their work in Antarctica. And apparently some, some of the poshest suburbs in Hobart, people can no longer get uh, insurance because of uh, rising seawater. So yeah, it's happening, it's happening folks. Another thing that's happening and happening and happened rather dramatically, both in January, 2019 and in January, 2016, uh, were huge uh, bushfires in the interior of the island. This was the first evening of the start of the bushfires in 2019. And it created this very dramatic but troubling looking sky. So all of this was going on probably about Within about 20 kilometers as the crow flies west of my, uh, my house. It didn't jump across the rather large estuary that's over there, the Huon estuary, but uh, a lot of people lost their homes. In fact, that's the kind of stuff that makes stories in the news when these events happen. 
people tend to be a bit less concerned about the damage to wilderness. But during that event, which went on for well over two weeks, about 3% of the entirety of Tasmania went up in fire. And almost all of it was either National Park or World Heritage listed uh, mountain landscape that had never, much of it had never known fire. A few days later, I went up to a little hamlet community in the, on the hills just behind us, about maybe 10 kilometers from where I, I'm sitting now. And th this was the, this was the result, these kind of smoke filled uh, valleys, uh, weird sunsets that seemed to last all day, uh, rosy pink orange skies, very poor air, air quality, absolutely horrendous. And yet Tasmanians feel as though they've got some of the freshest air on the planet, which is probably true, but it's not doing this. Um, so yes, uh, a, a, a very dramatic event to have been here to witness. It had happened in the north of the state in 2016, as I said, uh, where huge areas of uh, pristine wilderness were burnt in that event as well. So two huge events, three years apart. Uh, I, I don't think things in Tasmania are going to, can be expected to remain the same. Now, a lot of plant, a lot of the plant life in Australia is fire adapted. It burns, the seeds benefit from that, or at least if not from the flames, then from the smoke. And uh, it all springs anew. But there are a lot of plant communities in Tasmania that do not respond well to fire. Months after the, the event in uh, early 2019, we went up to Mount Field and took a bit of a further drive along that road. Mount Field is a large plateau-like mountain about two hours west of, of Hobart. Um, so it catches a lot of snow, beautiful uh, mountain terrain, quite, quite similar to a lot of Scotland actually, but there's forest everywhere, or there was. And you can see this is the results of those fires. Uh, millions of uh, cubic meters of, of uh, vegetation up and smoking into the air. There is some regrowth happening here in some of the grasses, but many of those trees were killed to the root. So that'll be a long time before that recovers. Gum trees, on the other hand, tend to bounce back. Uh, this is an example of something that doesn't bounce back. These are pencil pines. Pencil pine is an endemic uh, sort of cypress-like tree, uh, only lives in Tasmania. They live for in excess of a thousand years, 1200, 1400 years. And this is on, a, this is again in, in the National Park at Mount Field. And uh, these were burnt in the 1967 fires. I believe doing a bit of research that the fire was begun in a logging coop uh, by some loggers and it got out of control and it burnt the whole national park. So all those trees, they might have been there for centuries, uh, have been completely wiped out and they do not come back from fire. They're very poorly adapted for fire. but they do make for some nice sculptural subjects. And uh, I guess uh, you could say I uh, exercise a little bit of Ansel Adams kind of uh, technique in this one. But yes, very sad to walk through these areas and realize that even though 55 years has passed nearly, uh, there's been very little recovery of pencil pines in this area. Right, um, this photograph was taken very close to my house. Again, I can, I can get up there on a bicycle within about uh, 10 or 15 minutes. Um, 
the forest in the forest in Australia doesn't really change. So from the European perspective, it's a it's a pretty um, stable scene, I suppose. Gum trees don't drop their leaves; they don't change colour. Uh, but every now and again, there is a mass flowering of silver wattles. In fact, various wattles flower at different times. But in this case, these are silver wattles. Um, happens generally at the kind of tail end of winter, just as spring's happening. In fact, it's happening today. Uh, so that gives you a sense of, of what month of the year you might expect to see this. And silver wattles tend to live in a sclerophyll forest that is probably on the wetter side. So sclerophyll comes in various flavours, dry sclerophyll, which is what most of us probably think about the Australian bush, and then wet sclerophyll, where rainfall's a bit higher, soils are perhaps deeper, um, or maybe the aspect uh, on a southern facing slope. And then, if you're lucky enough, in the gullies, you'll get rainforest, true rainforest. This again is in Mount Field. Um, rainforest does not adapt well to wildfires. And in fact, uh, that was found to happen last year in the mainland up in, I think, northern New South Wales, the Nightcap National Park, largely a, ra a rainforest community of plants there and it was very badly burnt and isn't expected to recover at all well from that. So one of the one of the uh, very kind of palpable things that we see through a changing and warming climate. Another example of a little bit of rainforest this down near Hearts Peak, which is about an hour from, or an hour and a half perhaps, where, from where I live. And uh, this is, uh, this particular tree is a Nothophagus, or they just call them Phagus in this country. And that's one of the species that links uh, Tasmania with New Zealand and Chile, because they all have their own species of Nothophagus trees. So they, they need a, a high rainfall and do not respond well to bushfires. I haven't actually been back here since the, the bushfires in 2019. So whether this burnt or not, I don't know, but I know a lot of that area did burn badly. Another example of uh, the rain as it cascades around the, the hills just south of Hobart. We're looking into Kinanyi, Mount Wellington, park from here and uh, yes the rain can uh, be very uh, discriminating in where it falls some places will get more than others this is another little example of uh, a bit of rainforest north of Vegas trees Dixonia ferns which is a uh, a fern very common in the wetter areas of, of Tassie. And uh, yes, a permanently running stream. This is again in Mountfield National Park. And quite easy, uh, quite an easy spot to access. This is called Horseshoe Falls, in fact. There's another uh, example of, of the weather as it um, dramatically changes or as it flows around Kunanyi. These are, th these hills are very close to where I live. This is my local patch, I suppose. And the very famous Ruttle Falls in Mount Field National Park, a kind of unusual series of giant steps um, with trees growing mid-waterfall. Very, very uh, beautiful and 
uh, precious, really, part of uh, of this country. Mount Field was the first place to be designated a national park in Tasmania, as far as I know. Slightly higher up in the mountains, uh, you start to, the, the, the forest type changes. And uh, here we're in the kind of subalpine forest areas. So you can see a pencil pine there, one of the living ones. That's uh, on the left of the screen in the corner. And the others are all various species of, of montane gum tree or eucalypt, reflecting in a mountain tarn, a glacial lake. So glaciation, yes, that's probably worth referencing uh, or referring to. Uh, glaciation is not a thing commonly found in the mainland of Australia. There are a few spots up in on the high mountains of New South Wales and Victoria, but it's very rare. However, in Tasmania, this is a glacially formed landscape. So in that respect, it has uh, a resonance for me coming from Scotland. Now, this is a very, um, <laughs> the photograph looks a little bit out of step with the others, but I put that in there because I took this photograph on my first trip to Tassie back in 1989, whilst walking the overland track. And this was the last or second last day when a huge weather front came in. We'd walked for a week in uh, high 20s, maybe 30 degree sunshine. And then it all changed uh, in a rather dramatic fashion, which is what happens here. So all these, uh, like a phalanx of uh, alien battle cruisers or something coming over behind the, the Dollar Eight peaks. Um, so yes, uh, quite an old photograph this and scanned from a slide, hence the, the rather poor quality. But it does capture that dramatic changing quality of the weather that we get. This is a much more recent example of a lenticular cloud taken close to where I did, on the hill behind my house. And uh, I'm not a great wildlife photographer. I find it all too hard and uh, the equipment's too expensive, but that's a, a little Bennett's wallaby sitting there in the shot. Higher up again in the mountain, uh, the forest changes to probably its, uh, its final type, if you like. Um, that orangey colored, uh, what would you say? infill that you see in the other side of the lake or the tarn, that's, uh, that's Nothophagus gunnii, the other uh, type of Nothophagus that grows only in Tasmania. So another endemic tree, very poorly fire adapted, already been made extinct in at least one mountain range, the Denison range of, of Tasmania through fire. But here in Mount Field, it seems to have escaped the, the fire that killed a lot of the pencil pines, probably because the fire traveled around one side of the tarns and didn't cross over. So in this case, the water has been the saving grace. So North of Vegas is the only deciduous tree to grow in Australia. It changes color in the autumn to these beautiful oranges and yellows and reds, and then drops its leaves. Tiny little pretty leaves. And actually related to the phaguses of uh, the Northern Hemisphere in some dim and distant past. Here are some more pencil pines that have been burnt in a fire, probably in 1967 again, which was a, a huge fire event. In fact, there was a fire event that had devastating human consequences as well. It burnt right into the suburbs of, of uh, Hobart and many of the small surrounding towns. Uh, and the death toll was actually quite high. 70 or 80 people died in that, uh, that bushfire. And all of Mount Wellington apparently was just scorched 
back to to virtually uh, nothing. But this is up in uh, the Walls of Jerusalem National Park, which is another uh, favourite place of mine. I've been here a couple of times now. And you can see that amongst the dead trees, there are one or two younger living trees. So whether they escaped the initial fire uh, because of the, this is very boggy land that we're standing on, very, very wet, or whether they've grown since, I'm not entirely sure. And the, the plant in the foreground is called Scoparia, which is uh, in the same family as the heathers, believe it or not, although it doesn't really resemble heather. It comes in a whole suite of beautiful colours, white, pinks, oranges, magentas. And this is it again. Very spiny, adapted for uh, cold and heat. And uh, yeah, not to be messed with, not to be fallen into by, by uh, you know, mistake. And uh, yeah, altogether a, a very, a very uh, beautiful scene. And in fact, if you, if you, I don't know how many people are coming or tuning in from the United Kingdom, but the uplands of Tasmania are in remarkably good condition compared to the uplands of Great Britain, which have been denuded, felled, overgrazed for hundreds of years now, to the point where they look nothing like they should look. Well, in Tasmania, things look pretty much like they've always done, other than where more recent bushfires have gone, gone uh, raging through. Now, one of my uh, events or one of my trips out into the mountains uh, about uh, three years ago now, I was lucky enough to uh, encounter an aurora, aurora australis, they call them down here, the southern version of, of what you get in the northern hemisphere. And uh, I've actually seen more auroras in my four and a half years in Tasmania than in a whole lifetime in Scotland despite the fact that in Scotland we sit about 55 degrees north of the equator, and in Hobart we're only about 42 degrees south. But apparently it's all down to the shifting magnetic pole, and uh, that is bringing auroras very close to our latitude. So, uh, yeah, with modern camera technology, you can, uh, you can now hope to capture some of those pictures. In this image, you can see two smudges on the right-hand side of the screen. Uh, one's bigger than the other. Well, those are the Magellanic Clouds, the large and the small Magellanic Clouds, which are subsidiary galaxies to the Milky Way, and being sort of tidally torn by, by our far, far larger galaxy. But still, the large Magellanic Cloud has about 100 million stars in it, apparently and the small, maybe about 30. Now, this was a night of a full moon when I took this photograph, which is not ideal for auroras, but in this case, it was a very strong aurora event. And, uh, but it's been enough to illuminate the dead pencil pines on the other side of the, the lake, the kind of ghostly gray uh, trunks. So many of burns, but it's also incredibly wet. Even the wet areas burn. It's boggy, it's marshy, there are lakes everywhere. In fact, the vast majority of the naturally occurring fresh water in the whole of the Australian continent is on the island of Tasmania. It's uh, a place that, uh, thanks to the Roaring Forties, soaks up an awful lot of oceanic atmospheric water. And high up, even beyond the tree level, you get the shrub layers with some beautiful colours, uh, beautiful forms, uh, densely arrayed, almost like a garden. 
it's very hard to encapsulate it in words actually, or in photographs for that matter. Far better to get up there and walk in it and, you know, just spend time amongst it. The Scoparia again, uh, a kind of an orangey flowered uh, flavour of Scoparia. That plant there is called Pandani or Pandanus. Uh, it's related to the Scoparias and apparently they can hybridize, but they look nothing like one another. Uh, they're, they're a very odd alien looking, especially in this kind of a high mountain alpine environment. They're a very alien looking uh, species of plant, but very common. And this is a, a banksia, which is a flowering shrub that produces these huge loofah-like flowers, beloved of uh, bees and every other kind of insect, and nectar-eating birds as well. Many of the species of bird that live in Tasmania and, and Australia are adapted to feeding on nectar from flowering plants. This is a this is a little cushion plant. Again, another uh, rare plant only found in upland Australia, and very common, in fact, in uh, upland Tasmania. So it's uh, it's rather firm. It can take centuries to grow to a decent size. It, it lives as a colony, and uh, flowers in the high summer. So this photograph was taken in December and you can see it's flowering. I photographed a, a cushion plant about very late January and already the flowering has passed. This is near Cradle Mountain on a, a, a week long walk that I did recently. Now, the other aspect of flow that I had to shoehorn into this was, and I've mentioned it before actually, was the, uh, the warming effect of the Eastern Australian current. Now that has brought some invisible consequences like the dying of the, the giant kelp forests. But the more visible thing that it seems to have introduced are these huge algal blooms that at night you can uh, see as bioluminescent algae. So they explode into uh, these huge ripples of light as the waves break along the shores. Now, one of our, uh, one of our uh, audience members here tonight, maybe two of them, in fact, uh, will remember this because they were standing right beside me as I was taking these photographs when I, I was visited by Stefan and Joe. Um, coming up in three years ago now, and we went on a camp to Bruni Island. And uh, we had this dramatic show of bioluminescent algae. This photograph, perhaps a little less successful, but sparkles in the sky and sparkles in the water, it seemed to, uh, it seemed to make sense. And I think this is the only photograph with somebody in it, other than my self-portrait before when I was illuminating the dead gum tree. This is uh, Stefan going for a, a nighttime surf in the bioluminescent waves. So the warming waters have brought all this algae down here. Uh, and apparently 20 or 30 years ago, these events weren't really known in Tasmania, and they've become rather common events, apparently. Although I've only seen them as, as uh, dramatically as this on that one occasion. And I'll leave you with um, uh, this image of uh, my favorite bird, the uh, yellow-tailed black cockatoo. Very charismatic. They're always around my property here, usually in the 30s or 40s. They're very noisy, but very, yeah, very charismatic little birds. They remind me of um, 
uh, I don't know, biker gangs making a lot of racket, but not really doing too much damage. Um, so yes, I'll leave you with them. I'm not a wildlife photographer, but uh, this, this, this is what you get. Okay, I think I'm uh, all done. Uh, are there any questions in the chat that I can be directed to, Zeph? So we've not had any questions showing up just yet, but I'll give people a chance to send them in uh, just now. If anybody wants to just type a question, I'll read it out. But I was going to just ask, first of all, um, you're saying, obviously, you're uh, trying not to drive to a lot of these locations you're walking or you're cycling. So um, mm. how much um, equipment and, and gear are you able to take with you when you're doing that? Yeah, it does limit things a wee bit. Um, in, in recent years, I've actually moved to micro four thirds for a lot of the photography I do. The, in fact, notably the, of the photographs you've seen here, uh, the nighttime photographs I've used slightly heavier equipment, I suppose you might say. Um, but for almost everything else, it's been micro four thirds, which is lightweight. I, might, I, I carry a couple of lenses perhaps. So when I did that hike for a week, I had one small micro four thirds camera and two lenses, two zoom lenses to cover as much as I thought I might need. And in actual fact, I only used one of those lenses for 95% of the photographs I took. I could have well done without the, the long lens. So uh, yeah, I think I've just adapted to lighter, lighter equipment, but I'll probably do that as I'm getting older anyway, to be quite honest. <laughs> Yeah, there's a, that's a lot of um, similarity, I suppose, with people who do that kind of work. Um, when you're going out um, to these places, um, is it just on your own you would go most of the time? No, no, not, not, not necessarily. Historically, I, I took a lot of my photographs and walks with friends, which is not ideal because if your friend is a non-photographer, then they get a bit frustrated if you keep stopping and trying to set up a tripod or saying, oh, I'd like to do that again, or just give me another few minutes, you know. Um, here, in, here in Tasmania, no, um, I think it's probably an equal mix of me and my own and my bicycle, or if friends have come to visit and we, we do indulge ourselves with a bit of a, a drive somewhere to do a, you know, an overnight trip, then... Uh, I can justify it, you know, I can justify going in the car if I've got friends with me or visitors coming from overseas. But for myself, I can't justify it, so I don't do it. And it's something I've actually done for quite a number of years now. Um, probably to the cost of uh, fully getting to experience a place or fully indulge my photography, to be honest. But yes, yeah, it's just something that I have as a bit of a I hang up with that I can't I can't get over, you know. Mm -hmm. Brett, if you are able to uh, close down your share screen then um close down be... my share screen. Yeah, I think right. it's just stop, stop share. share. That's it. There. Um perfect. Then we can see everybody again. But um we had a question coming in there. Um Titus is saying, uh, can you talk us through how you managed to get the picture of the um, Aurora, um, what was it you called it, Brett, the Aurora Aus Australis. Australis. Yes, yes. Yeah. It's the Borealis up north and it's the Australis down here. Mm -hmm. How did I get that shot? Well, um, a little bit of experimentation. I had had a, a one Aurora before that, which was really the kind of steep learning curve. But I think I probably know enough about photography and how things work to, to just to experiment with the challenge. I mean, I, I used to be a photography lecturer, so I've got a little bit of, you know, experience in how cameras might work and how light would have to be adapted to any, any light form, any light source. In that case, I think because it was a full moon, I think the shutter speeds were quite, were relatively short. 
I mean, for example, I've taken Aurora photographs with 30 second and 25 second exposures. High ISO, around about 3,000, 3,200 ISO. But on that occasion, my ISO was lower, about 2,000, and my shutter speeds were about 10 seconds from memory. But I did experiment even on the uh, occasion. I, I, I was able to just check what was happening on the screen as every uh, shot was taken. And think, oh, I'll need a, a few less seconds there and a bit higher ISO. So that's kind of, that's kind of how it, it works. There's no one size fits all for any kind of photography, particularly at that uh, end of doing things, which all has to be manual inputs. So you're manually inputting your ISO, your focus has to be manually done because the camera can't focus in the dark. Uh, you have to manually input your shutter speed, uh, your f-stop all has to be manual. So. There, yeah, we are getting a few more questions coming in. Um, yeah. First of all, Anne was just saying um, that uh, she was loving getting to see all these pictures. She wishes that the Scotland uplands were still so beautiful. Um, and then uh, Stefan is saying, you know, you've covered, um, you've connected with some of the local um, conservationists and activists. Could you talk about what's happening in that respect with Tazi and what part of your photography, what part does the photography play in the struggle to raise awareness for that? Well, I think photography, uh, not my photography uh, personally, Stefan, um, I have to say, I've been a bit, uh, I've been keeping it under a bushel still. I've been doing that for far too long. But I do think photography has a huge role to play and the Wilderness Society, which might be the organization you're referring to, or the Bob Brown, uh, Bob Brown Foundation. Um, and I think you might have some links to share uh, about those two outfits, Zeph. Um, they both rely hugely on photography because they, uh, an image conveys so much more than uh, just some you know, words on a page. And uh, as we saw with the photograph I used right at the beginning of uh, Rock Island Bend by Peter Dombrovskis, that is actually credited with having stopped the damming of that whole river system. Um, it was a remarkable feat. I mean, there were other things going on. There were other activists involved. There were huge demonstrations. David Bellamy got involved in that, for heaven's sake. and. Uh, you know, he, he's, he's more associated with uh, mooching about down in the, the dirt in Britain than, than uh, saving the, the Franklin River. So I think there are, yeah, there are huge roles to be played, uh, but I haven't taken that step to become involved directly in that really. Yes, I'm in, I've, I've gone to meetings and I'm, I'm involved with uh, you know, the Green Party, for example, I've, I've done some uh, campaigning for them. But uh, can the photographs help? Yes, I think they can. Just not to this point necessarily mine. Yeah, I see. Uh, I suppose I would want to know then, um, with uh, everything that's happening in the wilderness, what are the expectations at the moment for the vegetation in the wilderness? How is it holding up? Well, uh, when you get conflagrations like we got uh, two, two and a bit years ago, um, they don't look good. Uh, it's known that change is happening. Temperatures are rising. That particular summer, we had a whole series of days where the temperature soared above 40 degrees centigrade in Tasmania, that is not common. Um, and it's not unknown, but it's not common either. But it seemed to happen frequently in that particular summer. So, you know, this, the, the, the writing seems to be on the wall in many ways. Uh, and, I, and I don't have the answers about how to stop that. I, I mean, I know what I know what 
probably should be done, but I can't see it being done. And the governments that we keep electing, and that's true of the state government here in Tasmania, who are all about jobs and growth and development, or the government that we have federally in Parliament, who are all about dig big holes in the desert, sell it to whoever will buy it, whether it be coal or iron ore. That's what they want to pursue. And if they're going to be, uh, you know, there's going to be collateral damage to the Great Barrier Reef or to the wilderness areas of Tasmania, then so be it. You know, that seems to be the price worth paying. I can't understand it personally. Yeah. Um, we had a moment ago, Simon was just saying um, he uh, would love to get to go to Tasmania. He's not been He's been close before, but he's not been. I think most of us are in the same situation after those photographs. I think we're all yearning to see what it's like. <laughs> um, but then Janie said, uh, you use Peter's photograph um, with your students. How did they react to your challenge to consider how they might use their photography? Uh, are you hopeful there's a generation of young photographers out there who are going to drive change? I, I, yes, I'm, of course I'm hopeful. And, and when you when you uh, work in environmental education, as I've done one way or another for 30 years, um, you, you're always aware that for every 100 acorns you, you put in the ground, you might only get one oak tree. And uh, I think it's a little bit like that. So some of my students, but I, my students were all 16, 17, 18 years old, and some of them have already kind of made up their mind about where they stand on issues or, or, or not at all. Um, there is a, in the United Kingdom, in the, the national curriculum, there was a, a compulsion that teachers had to refer or build in some reference to uh, sustainability in their teaching. And, and I took that to heart. So I would, you know, have lectures based around those subjects like, uh, can, can photography force change? And uh, I had an example of a photograph that did force change and I'd known about it for, for decades. I'd known, and I'd known about that photograph since the 1980s when I first heard about Peter. Um, how many of them have gone out to become uh, activists and campaigners? I don't know. Um, maybe not a lot, but when I see the school strike for climate kind of activism that's going on, and I've been to a couple of their events in Hobart as a as a, an observer. Uh, I'm very heartened that, that the young people of today might be they might be in the position to clear up our mess, but at the moment we've got to get through all the the uh, the naysayers and the you know, the, the, the politicians, for some reason, we keep electing. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's tough. It's tough. Um, but yes, I'm a hopeful. I, I, I think I'm hopeful is the best I can put it. That sounds a bit uh, equivocal, doesn't it? But there, there you go. At least it's hope. That's what we need to have. Um, so I'm, not seeing, I'm not seeing any other questions coming in just now, but I think... Um, I'll give anyone a chance if they have a last one, but I'll leave you with a bit of a, a hopefully a happier way to end. Is there anywhere else in Tasmania or close by that uh, you'd like to get out to photograph at some point that you haven't been before? Well, you know, that, that's, a, that's another good question. Um, I should probably have done a lot more of this when I lived in Australia the first time when I, I lived here back between 2000 and 2006, I lived just outside Melbourne. And uh, I was fitter, I was younger, I was e more eager to put myself through some, uh, you know, uh, tough challenges, I suppose. And I didn't do it then. And now I'm here <laughs> and it's on the doorstep. And I find it all too um, physically strenuous, <laughs> um, particularly, carrying a, a big rucksack in my back, you know. Uh, 
So the places I'd like to see, to answer your question, yes, there are places I'd love to see. I'd love to go down to the Western Arthurs. I'd love to explore those really remote areas. They take a week to walk in sometimes and a week to walk back out and you're walking every day um, over very rugged, steep terrain. But I don't think I will, to be honest. I went to Frenchman's Cap, which is a pretty remote mountain on the west coast of Tassie. Uh, uh, last year sometime, just before COVID actually. And uh, I found it very, very hard. It was only four days. I found it a very tough trip. And I'd just come off the overland track, which is a kind of a wilderness sanitized um, experience, I suppose. And that was, a, that was uh, seven days. And I did that a breeze. I, I found it very, very easy and straightforward. So, yeah, it's all about how rugged the terrain is. Um, so I, don't, I doubt I'll see the places I really want to see, sadly. Yeah. Um, One final question. I do have some favourite scientists. places I want to go back to. Mm -hmm. um, there is one uh, last question there. Titus was just wanting to know um, He's talking about he's done slideshows before showing um, mountaineering photos um, in mm. Adelaide. Uh, he's just wondering if you have any tips for um, setting up this slideshow or creating these images, if he could do the same kind of thing. I mean, what I did tonight to show to you, Titus. Yeah, just, to, just for what um, we were doing. Well, I, I used Google Slides, which my daughter put me on to because she knows about computers and stuff. Um, and I, uh, I, I, I put them all together and then I was able to save them as a PowerPoint. Now, I, I do have PowerPoint on this computer, but I don't on my own computer. Um, but at least you save it as a, P, I think it's called a PPT or a PPX file or something like that. So, um, sorry, so Brett. I did that. Hmm? Brett, it's sorry, it wasn't so much... That it wasn't so much the technology of it, but it's just like oh, I used to love having. We used to have these slideshows at the Mountaineering Club, and they're fantastic. And we'd sit there and we'd go off for a big trip, and it was a case of how do we get the twenty images? And I've forgotten to do this. You know, this is something that you know. I mean, you, I, you, you go for an adventure. And choose your best. Yeah, exactly. What I'm what was that? Because you you've oh, been sitting there taking photographs forever. And you've yeah. pulled that together into a really neat set of photographs. Yes, I know. Um, well, it's a, it's, a, it's a bloody good question because I, I think it took me about it took me about three or four days to go through four and a half years and hundreds of folders of images to draw out those ones. But to be fair to myself. They were images that I had appealed to me at some other point and I'd, I'd edited them. So I kind of knew where to go and look. The problem becomes immense where you have 10 years or 20 years of photography and you forget where you were, what year it was. I recently did a talk for a local uh, camera club in Huonville and uh, I did that on Yorkshire on my years, in fact, mostly of living in this one uh, small area of the Yorkshire Dale, it was called Wharfdale. And uh, yeah, I, it was very, it was very hard because I had 10 years worth of stuff to go back looking through to get it down to 70 slides. Tonight, I think I had about 50 slides or 52 slides or something like that. So yeah, it's, um, it's not a, Skill, I think I own, but I think just having at the time edited photographs mm -hmm. that I liked and kind of having a sense of where they might be has helped. Can I just ask if having a theme to speak to, such as flow, does that help you curate your collection? Yes, it did because I, I went for a lot of images that showed weather. And I am drawn to that anyway. I like to photograph weather. But when I did my talk at Huonville, she said to me, 
that the, the, the lady who invited me in to do the talk said, are there no blue skies in Britain? And I said, well, yes, but, you know, I don't like photographing blue skies. And I shall find we don't get an awful lot of blue skies, but um, I like, you know, it's about the, dram the drama of the, uh, the scene and the, the changeability. Sometimes you can invoke that in a photograph. And so, so the, yeah, that did help me make choices. Yeah. Um, we've got Mark is wanting to say something. Mark, feel free to just interject now. Okay, yeah. I was um, going to try and help Titus a little bit uh, because I remember ooh, it was probably about 20 years ago now when I started um, scanning all of my old uh, slides and negatives and things like that. And yep. um, one thing I realized that I needed to do before starting all that because there was thousands um is i first of all i just went through every film and uh just did a basic catalog of what was on there and also my best guess of when and where they were taken and things like that and i just put all i put all that in first of all i wrote it down as notes <clears throat> and then i put it all in a spreadsheet so i've got that and nowadays in the digital era we get a lot more information um with our images you know the, there for example there's always kind of like the date and time when it was taken and things like that and um, even with a lot of cameras which have uh gps built in you can get exactly where it was taken and things like that which is uh, a fantastic help <laughs> but one of the, yeah so one of the keys really is just to make some kind of record and these days also I use a program called Lightroom and I keyword things. So there's a lot more information. Um, I'm not going to try and pretend that I'm totally conscientious about that or anything like that. But I try to do it uh, as much as I can. Uh, and that, that kind of thing helps a lot in kind of keeping track of uh, where you've been, what you've done and what these photos are of and things like that. Yeah, so I saw the word popping up at one point. It might have been from Titus saying curate. I think, yeah. it, was, I think it was Titus put that up. Or was it you, Mark? I can't remember. Um, and I, rem I remember thinking, uh, yes, curate, that's the, that's the key, but how do you curate? I've been really bad at it. Mm. I think I, I, like you, I put in keywords or phrases or, or I, I list things in seasons. I do a lot of that, you know, winter, twenty. 12 you know mm. and then I can't remember but was up that mountain in 2012 or was it 2009 it could have been any damn winter you know and that's just a mm. function of yeah, accumulating masses of stuff and getting older I suppose and getting more removed from the event as well so um yeah I mean I can it, it, it can be partly handy to know certain details about the photograph that you took but I still sometimes have to go drifting and sifting through piles and piles of, uh, well, figuratively, uh, piles and piles of uh, electronic files to get the photograph I want, you know. Um, and sometimes I don't find them. Sometimes, I, I, you know, I just go, oh, I'll just have to find something else then for that particular slot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, another thing, keeping track of things. Um, <clears throat> and also part of the, <coughs> excuse me, all part of the curation is to make sure that you, uh, you, you have, um, redundant copies of things. So there isn't just one copy. Um, and I keep on transferring stuff from, uh, one medium to another. So for example, with, um, the scans and the early digital photography I did, um, you know, first of all, it was on CDs because I was quite ample <laughs> with the amount of data. But then mm -hmm. uh, as everything gets, um, you know, as, as the images get larger and the files get larger, move things on to um, DVDs. But even DVDs aren't really big enough these days. What I've got now is sort of like uh, several uh, multi-terabyte <clears throat> external disks. Um, yeah. 
so that and kind of have them mirrored as well so there's sort of completely you know more than one copy of everything and every now and again when i can remember i try and lodge one of these uh discs um with some friends so in the worst case that um i get burgled or the house burns down or something like that i won't have lost everything yes the house burning down that's a thing i really have to think about in fact if, that, if we have a we have a bushfire plan here every every mm -hmm. aussie resident's meant to have one and uh yeah one of the first things i'll grab is the uh the hard drive that i've, I've got a four terabyte hard drive that's got everything on it. I've got several other drives that have got parts of what's on the four terabyte drive. So as long as I've got that, I'll be fine. Everything else can go. Everything <laughs> else will be replaceable. Brett, we're just coming towards the end of the chat. And I just wonder, I mean, you've told some amazing stories today in the depth of your knowledge and understanding of the environment in Tasmania is is actually mind-blowing how do you feel about using your own storytelling talent and the photographs that you have to influence debate you've said you haven't quite used that yet you attend meetings and so on but for me certainly it was a very powerful and moving journey today and I think there is something in that have you a thought as to how you might use it uh, have I thought? Uh, have I thought about it? I guess I must have thought about it. Um, you know me, I've got this kind of uh, reluctance to... In fact, the, 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 you're the only audience that I've ever seen those photographs, uh, other than some that I may have posted on my personal Facebook page occasionally. Um, I haven't shown them to anybody else. In fact, even my family haven't seen most of them. So, uh, yes, it's probably time to 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 uh, yeah be less shy about it and uh, and engage. Mm. Well, maybe today's the start of that. So maybe on that note, we we say that's the start point. <laughs> uh, and the fact that this talk's been recorded and Zeph will edit it and it'll be uploaded to YouTube and therefore can be shared. Um, but thank you, Brett. I thoroughly enjoyed that. Pleasure. Um, a pleasure. I'm one of your greatest fans, you know that. But uh, I think tonight I you've probably uh, gathered a few more fans along the way. So can I just say thank you to Brett and invite everyone to thank Brett um, for tonight's chat. That was brilliant. Thank you very much. Thank um, you. Thank you. And if thank you, you would Zeph, like... for uh, <laughs> doing what you did. Thank you. Fantastic being the kind of org the ringmaster, as it were. <laughs> and nice to meet much. you, Mark, finally, after all these years. That's right, yes. Uh, we're Facebook friends, but we've never actually met. That's right. <laughs> That's great. That's right. And this How do you part pronounce of... your surname? Sorry? How do you pronounce that surname? Lovejoy, just like that. Yeah, but it's French, French originally, so it should be Lovejoy, but everybody says Lovejoy. So. Very exhausting. So silent with <laughs> Silent. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Um, if you would like to copy some of the um, information that was put in chat, there's little three dots in your chat box. If you click on those, you get the option to save chat, and that will drop into your uh, onto your desktop under a Zoom file in Documents. Uh, I think that's where it generally falls. Um, so if you want to save the chat and those references that Zef copied in, that's where you'll be able to do that. Um, so thanks again, Brett. One final thank you. And thank you all for coming and supporting Sterling Photography Festival from right across the world. Sydney, Barcelona, Queensland. Lovely to see you all. <laughs> <laughs>